What's up, everybody? Dave the Car Guy. You know what time it is? Shop Talk Live coming at you live. <laughs> I'm here with industry rock star Carolyn Coquelin. Clearly a hardcore German name. <laughs> Carolyn, she is a rock star in the industry because not only is she a fellow shop owner, but she's creating a platform for our point of sale systems that are revolutionizing what we do. So Carolyn, what, uh, give us your, give us your timeline. How, how in the world did you get here? Uh, well, you invited me here. I'm very grateful for that. Uh, had the, yeah, had the, had the, um, good fortune of finally getting down here. I can't believe it's taken me all this time, fellow hybrid shop right. folks. And it's awesome to see Take what you've got going me. on down here, but yeah, no, I, uh, I opened my repair shop, it was 13 plus, well, a little over 12 years ago, and I looked at some of the shop management systems that were out there at the time, and I was just like, this is just not going to work, not going to work for our customers, it wasn't going to work for us, and that sort of set off a journey, not only in terms of changing the way we were going to do auto repair, but also how we were going to run our business and, and use uh, innovation, and obviously everything that's happened since then, phones, cloud, all that. Uh, to really help us get more done. So cool. So you started a repair shop, and how long after decided, hey, you know what? Not only am I going to try and do this easy job, <laughs> but I'm going to create a software too. Wh when? When? How did that all? It was part of the the value proposition. So so the the repair shop opened. It was 2007, San Francisco hybrid cars. And the iPhone had just come out, and we looked at the existing systems, and we were like, these are all crap. Uh, we need to do something new. So I decided I was going to make a POS. Because, you know, only, only arrogant people have the audacity of thinking they can fix cars and make money at it. So that's, that's shop owners. And so when you're already a shop owner, you, 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 you have the, the audacity to think you can make software also. So that was just, you know, that was one and the same. So I decided to make a software application that was cloud and... Um, transparent to our customers and allowed us to run paper free and then we uh, had that for about till 2012 and I actually put it in some other shops some other shops were using that system and then we finally decided that the code base was just too rickety for us to scale on it wasn't SAS so we started over with the fresh code base in the summer of 2013 and shopware was born you can't run anything without a sassy database. <laughs> That's right. That's from what I hear. And since all these other things that we've been using are called POSs, um, I feel like we should come up with a new name for shopware because mm. it can't be a POS, mm. can it? Yeah. What was a GSD? I was talking to somebody that you put GSD at the end of your name. All right. So maybe it's it's uh, shopware GSD. Okay. But, and uh, let's let's. Let's highlight for the audience, what is GSD? GSD, getting shit done. That's what I'm talking about. So if you want some GSD at the end of your shop name, you can, That's right. you can throw that in there. Yep. But um, I, I usually use MSH, which is make shit happen. But ooh. I like that one too, GSD. Yeah. Sounds good. They're one of the same. You could be one of those like multiple professions where I it's could. the GSD, MSH. Yep, have a whole you know signature line with all these acronyms on it that nobody knows what they are. And I would feel amazing. I might even put doctor in front of my name. <laughs> so... So shopware, the, the basis of shopware now. So you are not full-time in the shop anymore, correct? No, not at all. Yeah, I, I would think that that would be impossible. We still have some B-roll of me working on a car from back when I didn't have any gray hair, which just goes to show how long ago that, that role was taken. She's 21 but, and used to have dark yeah, hair. The, <laughs> um, and uh, have been working on sort of recasting. You know, you spend so much time, you can appreciate this, aligning your brand with your business to really uh, personalize it and um, just you know generally bring more depth to the um, information that you're presenting online yep. and then pretty soon that's like all that's there it's really hard to change all the content that's already on cheers <laughs> cheers um, so it's been a bit of a challenge to sort of recast who is Carolyn as uh, the CEO of Shopware instead of just running my repair shop. But I haven't yeah. been in the repair shop for, gosh, five years. I mean, I've been full-time on this project for uh, the majority of, of its existence, and so it totally dominates my time. I, I believe it. You know, it's um, – so as you know, I was active in, uh, in, in Kikui mm -hmm. when they first started, right? So we were like shop – I don't know, 
I think I saw eight. a demo and it had Tools Garage yeah, in it. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. So awesome. it's kind of cool seeing the progression of a, a company. So when, when we first signed on, they were like, I think there was like four people in there. Wow. So seeing where they have gone because of the demand mm -hmm. of this industry, mm -hmm. really it it's going to set the tone for how you are going to progress because there's a need in this industry for what you're providing right now. And I already know that there's a ton of shops that use your software because I'm in multiple groups with them. They swear by it. And I don't think that that's going anywhere anytime soon. So yeah, it's been really cool actually to Gray watch. Gray hairs are coming. Yeah. yeah. All right. There's probably more, more in my future. It's been cool watching Kukui's success uh, and a lot of the younger, really innovative companies that have come up in yeah. the last 10 years. I mean, uh, Todd's done an amazing job and you can just sort of uh, gather your inspiration from what they've been doing and how you can add value to people who do the hard work every day, yeah. right? There's folks that are fixing cars every day, all day. And in a lot of ways, the aftermarket takes us for granted. Yeah. You know, they just been sort of harvesting off of all of our hard work and to really flip that script and try and add value mm -hmm. uh, as a service provider to the service providers. That's been really important for me. Yeah. And you get to, you get an opportunity to to see a company go from nothing to large relatively quickly. Mm. So you can maybe see things that occurred that you can head off the pass or occurred that was like, hey, I want to get there quicker. Um, it's it's kind of cool because all these things are right in our backyard, right? You're here in the great state of California, and so is Kikui. So it's mm -hmm. it's kind of a it's kind of a neat thing. Um, and being an advocate space. of our industry, mm -hmm. you know, myself, I like to see innovation. I like to maybe someday be a business owner and says, you know what, we can make money as a shop owner. Well, you're making money as a shop owner right now. We're trying to make money as a shop owner. So how's the MSO uh, challenge coming along? That is coming along. Um, it's, it's unique because, you know, thankfully we've made some good business decisions that have allowed the slow process to mm. get open, mm -hmm. not bury us. Mm -hmm. Because like, you can easily see between permitting and, build out if you are not prepared for that you can e easily sink the ship before even getting the first oar in the water mm -hmm. so uh but it's it's coming along pretty well and um i'm thankful i did shop number two the way i did it with the with a building purchase a land purchase via another uh property that i had done back mm -hmm. in in the dot com days and the the crash days, mm -hmm. I bought uh, a property in East Palo Alto and ended up being able to sell it this last year to buy this Congratulations. other Congratulations, that's Thank great. Because I wouldn't have been able to do it otherwise, right? Mm -hmm. So, but because of that, it allowed us to kind of, you know, absorb some time while this is happening. Shop number three, however, might be a different story. But we'll, uh, we'll, leave, the, uh, we'll leave that to when it, when it starts to come into fruition. Okay. I'll stay so tuned. Knows? Stay tuned. Yeah. Because we may have shopware in three locations. That's right. So um, where do you see shopware going? What's your what's your plans with, with this? Uh, well, you know, <clears throat> 10,000 shops would be nice. And uh, being able to consolidate some of the influence of service, pro service providers mm -hmm. so that we can do some collective bargaining and other things that uh, allow us to benefit from each other as a community. That's, I think, the long-term goal for sure. And I don't know, we're in a really interesting position right now. Do you need me to pull this mic close? Thanks, Sean. Um, uh, so being able to leverage the network and also learn from the network. I have a lot of exciting plans for 2020. Mm -hmm. Um, but you really start to just aggregate the opportunities as the community grows. So that's been really exciting to, to think about and start planning for, for sure. Cool. So um, full force shopware, 10,000 shops. What type of projection is that? Is that five-year mark? Yeah, is that a... That's probably a five-year mark, if not a little sooner. Probably a little aggressive for less than that, but five years is doable. Cool. Mm-hmm. 
and your um, the way that you guys are adding things to shopware. How's that done? I mean, right now we've used several different sure. POSs, um, <laughs> and some of them actively, you know, push out updates. Some of them actively never push out an update. <laughs> so where, where do you fit in that? Don't in rock that? the boat. Yeah. Um, well, I won't name names because I know what you're running right now. But the uh, uh, we do a release once a week. So we have a team of developers as well as a standard regression suite process and, and QA to allow us to uh, deploy on a regular basis. And we are excited to both work on long-running projects that we can uh, deliver incrementally, but also keep a steady pace of, of um, uh, user requests and other stuff onto the application. So we're usually sending out release notes to the community uh, bi-weekly and then um, taking, obviously, our user feedback into the application uh, readily and, and trying to get, get back to users what they're asking for. So we're super active in, in growing the application and doing so in a way that is uh, non-disruptive and is really additive to the, the folks that are running it every day. Right. You know, we joke, you know, if Facebook goes down, nobody cares, right? No one's running their business on Facebook. Uh, Shopware cannot go down, and so it has to have exceptional reliability. Yeah. So <clears throat> we currently have uh, three nines. We're nine eight at the very end of that uh, decimal place, and so you know that's like Amazon-level reliability. Um, but also when you talk about releases and being able to you know, continually add to the product and not screw the product up, yeah. to do that professionally has been something that, that we've, we've built and we're really proud of. Um, and, our, and our customers would, would talk about that. You know, they'd speak to that. So we've, we've really perfected, I wouldn't say perfected because you're always trying to improve, but we've really yeah. done a great job being able to fold continual value into the product. Yeah, because what happens is the software start to get so innovative that they end up with so much stuff in there. Mm. And us as people are easily distracted. You end up going down the, what was I saying? <laughs> no, I say, you're going down the rabbit hole and you can't find what you were looking for in the first place. So yeah. really trying to keep it very simplistic and functional is, um, yeah. is huge. So, um, yeah, and the other, the incumbent systems too have been around for decades and they have, you know, everything in the kitchen sink. So obviously users have a lot of requirements and folks want to see whatever their favorite features were from their previous system also yep. in shopware and being able to accommodate them without actually disrupting users or turning out with like, you know, the Mitchell paradigm where you have 300 different reports to choose from and none yep. of them are exactly what you're looking yeah. for. So it requires a lot of discipline to be able to build something that is useful across the board. Yep. Um, and that as an interface, you're not, uh, you know, like you get an update on your phone and you're just like, oh, why did you do that? You know, yeah. I used to be able to use this thing. You know, yeah. you can't, you can't do that. So, uh, yeah, we have to That's keep all funny. those things in mind. So I got a question for you. So our industry, I do a lot. I know you watch me every single every week, week. on every platform possible, um, Wh which I, is Facebook, Facebook, Insta, Insta LinkedIn. LinkedIn, you know, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. um, I talk a lot about our trades and, and you know getting younger generations mm. in or even just getting people trained up enough. Mm -hmm. So women in the industry. Mm. So you were actually a mechanic. Mm -hmm. So can you let our audience know what was that like for you as a mechanic? Mm -hmm. And do you or how do you propose we get more women mm -hmm. in our industry as automotive technicians? Because, mm -hmm. you know, it's a changing world that is... I think right up their alley. Sure. Right. I mean, I've always found it an extremely rewarding occupation. So I would expect you know anyone, regardless of gender, to enjoy it. Uh, you know, it's something we lack every day nowadays, which is you know I get to do something with my hands. I see tangible results. I understand the value of my work. You know, a lot of what people do these days, especially in this area, it just feels very detached. Right. You're sort of you know you're working sort of part of the cloud. It's in this virtual world okay, great, you know, the application updated or something, but what did you actually do with yourselves, yeah. in, you know, in the course of a day's work or a week's work, um, which I think makes our industry that much more attractive and valuable. It's just how do we pay people and how do we give them the workplace that is commensurate with 
uh, you know, what skills they might be bringing to other kinds of industries. So, for example, yeah. someone around here can go, all right, I could work at Facebook or I could work at Tools Garage. You know, how do you make it, you know, compelling for them to come work at Tools Garage and work on, you know, high-tech cars? You guys are doing the whole gambit, right? You're doing, you know, advanced diagnostics on brand new cars and mm -hmm. you're doing tuning and stuff on, on the old stuff. So yeah. you're like, you know, that's like... For someone who really wants to learn cars, that's super exciting. Yeah. Um, but also, you know, they have to have a great place to set up their toolbox. They have to feel supported. They have to have training. So it's a lot of pieces, parts to make people feel good about the work and to nurture them, right? I mean, we're all so busy just trying to figure out the cars and take care of customers that it can be hard to really foster yep. uh, new talent. And <clears throat> so all those things are certainly stuff, you know, we're working on in my shop. We've been able to hire a bunch of people out of the local um uh, trade school out of uh, Skyline, which mm -hmm. has been amazing. They have an incredible program. Yep. Uh, and so we have a bunch of young folks that we're, we're training up through that. <clears throat> but even finding journey level or senior level folks, a lot of those folks are just retiring or they're, they've, they've moved on or they've moved out of the Bay Area because yeah. it's been harder for them to find a place they can raise their kids. Yep. So it's been really tricky to figure out how to you know, continue to keep that knowledge in-house to foster that younger generation. Yeah. In terms of attracting women to the business, I think... You know, as long as you have a, um, a welcoming environment, mm -hmm. uh, that's about it. And certainly my experience, I've worked with some really great guys over the years. I've not had a significant flack. I think, you know, at some point you have to just be able to hold your own and, right. you know, tell someone to F off yep. if you need to. But, uh, you know, generally speaking, if you can fix the cars, it's a non-political environment. And as long as the leadership is, wants to support you and grow, mm -hmm. you know, it's a great place for women. Cool. What's your thoughts when you walk into Tools Garage? Uh, well, it's clearly a very professional operation. Um, super clean walk-up, beautiful sign. I like the sliding door at the entrance. That's really convenient. You know, you're carrying your kid and mm -hmm. your bag and everything, and you don't have to deal with that. So first impressions, people walking in and being like, oh, you know, I had, had some, uh, <laughs> it's like you get a, bit of, get a belt on that. Um, I haven't heard that sound in a while. Yeah, me neither. <laughs> um, they still got a lathe here at Tools. Um, on car. Yeah, on car. Uh, the best tools and equipment here, folks. Come down, put in your application. So, uh, yeah, I think, <laughs> thank you very much. Uh, so, yeah, no, it's super clean. And, you know, I've heard so much about the business. Obviously, it's been a uh, poster child for a lot of the different companies, Kikui especially, in terms of sort of next generation. I think what's most impressive to me is how you're able to present as a contemporary business with sort of the, the tools and training need in for brand new cars, but also keep that hot rod uh, classic and, and muscle, you know, culture in it too. So you've got the little um, display, display case, case with yeah. stuff in it that's yep. cool. Because it's hard to balance that, right? If you go too really hard is. towards the, the classic side, it can alienate the new customers and yeah. you know, the minivan crowd yep. and then vice versa. Uh, we certainly have that in our shop where we've got a bunch of Prius and then someone pulls in their Land Cruiser and like sort of the Prius folks are looking at the Land Cruiser yes. folks and the Land is, Cruiser folks are, are looking at the Prius folks and you, you can't make both of them happy. Yeah. You all go burn gas. It's going to be okay. Yeah. Um, but uh, yeah, that can be a hard balance to strike. It is. I think, uh, I think that's the biggest thing, you know, and, and in the, uh, the older car world, it's very hard. Mm. <laughs> this is the best hot water I've ever had. Um, in the older car world, it's very difficult to get parts, and you know mm. the product knowledge on it is right. oddly enough way more simpler. Mm. But when you don't see it, it's more complex. Sure. Right? It's like, oh my gosh, what's holding all these brakes together? Well, it was invented in 1960, so <laughs> it's not that hard. It might be bigger, mm -hmm. you know, bigger and more rough to work with, but. Um, we do try and keep a, a vast array of new and old because, mm -hmm. you know, we, we like to see the classics out there. Mm -hmm. I love it when somebody comes in and we see modern technology in the old car because mm -hmm. it really all comes down to the, the classic body lines, right? Mm -hmm. As you get older, mm -hmm. your body lines start to change <laughs> it up a little bit. And we always try and make sure, how can we stay relevant in today's world? So the old cars are no different. You know, we like to see them out there, safer to drive on the road, mm. uh, good braking systems, good efficient gas engines or something. Um, there are cars that we've seen that have gone electric, which is 
kind of cool. Seems sacrilege for some, but kind of cool on the on the flip side of it. I've seen some very very powerful muscle car, all electric cars that will make that will make your eyeballs hit the back of your skull during acceleration. So, you know, it's not a it's not always just about the the performance of it, but some of it's sound. You know, there's a lot of different cool variations with cars. So, What's your take on the Tesla market? Well, not just market. What do you think of their applications? Um, you know, I really liked the Tesla S when it came out, sort of, the inside. I wasn't a huge fan of the look of it, you know. To me, you know, I'm going to take, I'm going to use Audi, for example. Audi makes a beautiful car. Hmm. If your Tesla looked like a nice Audi R8 or something like that, or something similar. That would, that would be like lights out. I mean, that's, you have to have one of those. The Audis are, or Audis are, uh, they're beautiful, but they, <laughs> they help repair shop owners actually make money. Right. Because they're always broken and very expensive. So if you had a, a full electric, like a Tesla in an Audi lookalike body, I mean, an Audi lookalike body, I mean, that's a, that's a huge thing appealing thing um, so i'm not a huge fan of the s body lines i like the tech inside the model three is a little too sparse for me mm. um for me as a driver i'm very in tune to the road i'm not the guy you want to go on a road trip if you want to have a huge conversation because i'm don't talk but having a giant screen in the center console probably is not the best idea you know, I see a lot of Teslas with front end damage. <laughs> and if you <coughs> wonder why, it's because a person like me is driving. And I... Well, it's amazing because they've got the self-driving going and you're watching it sort of frame out the road in front of you. And so, of course, you're fascinated by that. So you're staring at the screen, watching it sort of figure out the road while mm -hmm. the, ro <laughs> the road is actually in front of you. Yes. Uh, it's pretty remarkable. It, it's scary. It's scary. Um, their, their X is pretty cool. I like, I like the gold wing doors. You know, I, I've had some friends with some issues because, you know, you start having a lot of moving parts like that. You end up with leaks, noises, squeaks and rattles and stuff mm. and such. Um, but again, it looks like a giant Prius. You know, I, if you're going to do something exotic and cool, it should be spend some money and make it look nice. Uh, the truck. Anyway, um, if you don't have anything good to say, that's what they tell you. What's your take on the, on the models? Um, you know, I haven't spent that much time in them. I rented a Tesla over Thanksgiving, and it was hilarious because I, I got it because my parents were coming to town. They're from Ohio, and we were going to do a lot of driving. Um, my stepdad isn't quite as mobile anymore, so it was like, all right, we're going to go like up the coast. Let's get a cool car to drive in. This will be interesting. And then it turned out that like they couldn't fit in the car, like they couldn't like bend sufficiently to like get into the seats. I was like, oh, that's uh, too bad. <laughs> um, we did manage to get no them in, into the car, but um, <laughs> I was just like, oh, this isn't designed for older people. Uh, but I'm just inspired by the the creative ideas. You know, they're just getting started, right? Yeah. This isn't the end. It's so yeah. easy to be critical of the first iteration, right? Like, oh, you know. It doesn't do this, it doesn't do this, blah, blah, blah. And I mean, obviously, you know, I have some personal experience in that space where it's like, you know, super frustrating to always have to be um, answering to the marketplace and yeah. like sort of like the end game where it's like, we're going to get there, we'll yes. get there. Um, time. Yeah, so I'm, I'm really inspired by what they're doing. And I think they've got a lot of courage to take on the big boys, too. They've kind of said, you know what? Oh, they've already crushed them. Yeah, so it's pretty, them. it's pretty impressive. So I think I'm more interested on the business side of things yeah. than I am on the, on the tech side of things. But, you know, so we... What's your take on the batteries, though? So here's, here's, my, here's my fear of batteries. And I'm, I'm in this space, right? So in, back in 99, I was a shop foreman at a Honda dealership. And as that... I was the guy who had to go look at 
this insight thing because it was technology that we've never heard of, right? Mm -hmm. So back then, my question to the people that were training us was, you know, what happens when the battery goes bad? And their answer back then was, oh, yeah, yeah, we're not worried about that yet. And I'm just like, you know, seems like that's a thing, yeah. right? Because I've had remote control cars, and when they're dead, they're, I have to <laughs> throw them away, right? So here we are, you know, 18 years later or whatever, 20 years later, um, we, we do a lot of battery work. Mm -hmm. These are on batteries that are right, as big as this table. Yeah. So now you're talking about the entire vehicle powered by a battery. Right. When it dies, what do we do? What, what, is the, what is the value of that car? What are we going to do with that car? Yeah, it, it remains to be seen what the aftermarket's going to do with, with battery electrics, right? We've obviously found a market with hybrids, and we replace batteries on hybrids all day long. Mm -hmm. And when the, the hybrid first came out, they said, oh, you know... The battery's going to be $10,000. You're going to yeah. throw your car away. Well, and lo and behold, that's not the case. And we right. figured out how to fix it. Some of them are. Yeah. Um, and so we, you know, we, we found a market there. And I yeah. think we'll find a market with the electrics, too. One of the challenges is, you know, they just made one hybrid, basically. They made the Prius. Mm -hmm. The Honda made, you know, Honda made some. And, you know, Ford made the Escape and the, the Confusion. God bless them. But um, the, uh, the, the Prius is dominated, so it makes it very easy to specialize in yes. that space. The electric side, you know, everybody's got one. They're all different, different form factors, yep. obviously different BMS. So, like, okay, how are we going to get an aftermarket equivalent? What's going to be the, you know, the off-the-shelf for uh, a Tesla? We have had folks come in and do, <clears throat> remove the, the battery pack out of Leafs mm -hmm. and do a, a 3D scan of the bottom of the Leaf to come up with the form factor for a replacement. Mm -hmm. So that was kind of interesting, some R&D at... At my shop, I'm sure you've got plenty of experience with stuff like that. People come in and say, hey, we've got this crazy idea. Let's take this car apart mm -hmm. and see what we can do. And yep. I'm sure as a market appears, there's going to be people who want to fill it. Yeah. Um, but right now, I don't think there's, I think most of those cars are still going back to the dealership. And so we haven't, we really haven't had to figure it out yet. Yep. My, my concern is that, that, you know, your Tesla, you've seen the Tesla battery. That's the entire car. Yeah. I mean, really, it's a, it's a. Fifty, sixty thousand dollar vehicle with a forty thousand mm -hmm. dollar battery pack in it, mm -hmm. and it, when it comes time to having to replace that, is someone going to want to spend that? You know, even if it's twenty, mm -hmm. you know, half half the cost, are they going to want to change replace it, or are they going to want to scrap it? And there's been some you've, there's been some articles and stuff on folks that were doing salvage Teslas. Did mm -hmm. you see any of that stuff? Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's really interesting. Uh, less battery pack, but. Yeah, well, it remains to be seen if they'll be, you know, modularized. I'm not sure how the batteries fit together, where it's actually serviceable or not. They're but, not very. You know, <clears throat> a friend of mine built a um, jet engine uh, gen set that ran on the back of a trailer that he attached to his leaf. So how it worked was he put jet fuel in a little uh, fuel tank that ran in this on this trailer that he, mm -hmm. he put a hitch on his leaf. Yep. And then he hooked the the gen set so we had the the jet engine running with an electric motor that then was like a you know a series um electric that just basically then connected up to the chatamo like direct dc charging outlet for the leaf so he could charge the leaf battery from jet fuel when he ran low and that thing could go like 600 miles and you just pull over and whatever go to your local airport yeah, and, and get some local, jet fuel jet fuel station but you know he basically create this little um uh, gas engine or, you know, regular fossil fuel powered uh, generator that ran on the back of his leaf. He could, could drive that thing anywhere. You know, it's a little Armageddon-esque. It's like the biodiesel folks that, right. you know, put like yeah. get a thousand French gallons oil. of French oil in their <laughs> trunk. But um, anyway, you never know. Maybe we'll just get those. It's like um, you saw Looper where they had the, the little the little pipe that was coming off the Prius tailpipe and then went back yep. in the, the gas tank and yep. you weren't quite sure what the hell that thing is doing. Yep. But whatever the, the idea was, we might have to just run our Teslas off a little uh, biodiesel we're going generator full and Mad Max <laughs> pre pretty soon. That's the joke that we're going to we're going to buy a, a a Tesla Roadster and convert it back to a Lotus. Yeah. So you know, fix fix there that car. <laughs> let's let's, uh, let's come up with an idea that we can make these batteries charge. Let's put a gas let's engine in it. Let's put a gas it. engine in it. Yeah, right. That's, that's how a, we'll solve it. Yeah, that's that's going to solve this battery issue. Mm -hmm. So anyway, yeah, it's a weird it's a weird thing. I'm I am a I'm a battery fan. I'm a electric motor fan, but it's still scary. We've had a leaf, you know, and sometimes you're out on a road and you're just like, 
Yeah. <laughs> I got how many to go and how many to get back? Damn it! I gotta, tu- I gotta turn around. Yeah, I gotta turn around. That's it's range anxiety they call it. It's mm-hmm. a, and it's a real thing. Yeah, those those cars didn't have very much range. Mm-mm. So no, so. So shopware, you're to, you know, the thousands of shop owners that are watching us right now that are not on shopware, compel them. Why would they want to come and use shopware? What's, what's so much better about shopware than what they're doing right now? POS out there. Well, uh, existing, uh, shop management systems are paper makers. So you're using a computer to make paper, which is incredibly wasteful. Not only should you use a computer to be a computer, but Paper is not automated. Anytime you look at a piece of paper, you're looking at human time and effort. Humans have got to move that paper around. Humans have got to keep track of it. And if humans are involved, you're talking about making mistakes. So you get the paper out of your business, and you're going to have instant efficiencies. And also, you're going to look a lot more sophisticated to your customers. So <clears throat> one of the things that is our big differentiator is the customer experience mm-hmm. and the fact that you can actually collaborate with your customer online. And that allows them to not only buy your services more quickly and easily, and you don't have to spend as much time playing phone tag, um, but also it makes you look a heck of a lot more sophisticated, right? If you're working on advanced technology on vehicles, why would you pick up the phone and use a 1990s technology or a piece of paper that's 600-year-old technology to communicate with them? That makes you look bad. So around here, certainly, and this kind of get, gets back to the um, sort of genesis of the project, which mm-hmm. was... This, this kind of stuff was necessary for me to be able to meet my customers where they were at the yep. time. And that's just true of everybody nowadays. Everyone's got a smartphone. Yeah. Everyone's working on advanced technology. You do really hard things in your shop every single day, and your customers deserve to see that. Your customers deserve to appreciate that. Yep. And also, you need to make better use of the resources that you have in your shop, right? So you've got all these precious technicians, service advisors, folks that cost money. You can't afford to just keep plugging them into the phones and plugging them into the, the shuffling of paper around. That's just not efficient. You're not going to be able to stay profitable. No. Yeah, a lot of times uh, the, the, the client has, hasn't really a clue of how much stuff happens back here. Totally. You know, these guys are, are amazing because to, in order to stay in business and try and remain somewhat, you know, as a profitable business for our clients – these guys are working on three, four cars a day. So all these cars that get dropped off have to go in strategically mm-hmm. at the right time, get inspected at the right time, get a hold of you at the right time right. to make the, you know, the orchestra work because mm-hmm. they just, you know, they just see, hey, I, I brought my car in. Mm-hmm. It had an appointment. It should be worked on. Good to go. It's never almost never quite like that, right? Well, every car is a question mark. We, we perform miracles every single day fixing cars, right? Oh, yeah. You can't predict what that car is going to need <laughs> until it's already in your bay and you've looked it over. Yeah. Um, and a lot of folks, I mean, even the developers that I work with, they get involved with our project and they're like, man, this is really complicated. It's like, yeah, no, fixing cars is really hard. Yes. <laughs> um, you know, holy shit, you got to connect with this uh, you know, e-commerce portal, and then you got to pull estimating data from where, and then you got to put it all together and calculate sales tax, and you got to, you know, send it all back of house to your accounting software, and just like, wow, this is like one of the more complicated application sets out there. I mean, honestly, I was talking to Scott Brown. I'll do a little plug. We're going to have a presentation at ASA Colorado this weekend. So I was talking to him yesterday, and uh, we're going to co-present there, which I'm really excited about. But he was talking about how the automobile is the most complicated piece of technology that people touch on a daily basis, that people use on a daily basis is your car. Yep. And people just do not understand that. We live in this like magic carpet society where just magic things happen for mm-hmm. us and we really don't have to appreciate what makes it possible. Yeah. And obviously us as a business, our job is to make it possible for that thing to be there for you. Yeah. So reliable. You know, mm-hmm, being reliable, it's not only that it works, but it stays that way yeah. and so on. Um, so yeah, I mean, we're in a really interesting position. Not only are we uh, extremely challenged to stay up to speed with all of the different changes and innovation on the cars. Um, but we're also in a position to really shift the way consumers have seen us. Like we're really advocates. We're really making it possible for you to continue to own this really complicated piece of technology. Yeah. Uh, and I think there's a great opportunity for our industry as we sort of turn over. You can actually see it with you know shops like yours and other folks that are in the business that are really kind of shifting the way customers see us and they can start oh wow these are really professional people that care about me 
that are providing consistent services. Yeah. Um, so anyway, I'm really optimistic about where the industry is headed, and I think that um, while there's still a lot of work to be done, finding the techs, learning the new cars, um, being able to stay profitable, all that stuff, there's a lot of exciting new stuff that's going on, new yeah. people that are in the business. It's a great challenge. People are inspired by it. The folks have kind of been harvesting and sort of cranky. They're moving out. You know, we've sort of like... Um, all the old guys with... Yeah, we, we sort of started turning over. We got some new blood in the in the industry, and it's really cool. It's really exciting to see them, and everyone's got new ideas, yeah. and there's just a lot of excitement going yeah. on. It's yeah. cool to be a part of it. The way we the way we've always done it is not quite a management phrase anymore. Mm -hmm. You know, the the evolution mm -hmm. of cars, the evolution of business, the mm -hmm. evolution of technicians. It's it is exciting if you're open to it. Right? Mm -hmm. The old school owners are not interested in having this younger generation kind of pick up the pace because yeah. they're like, no, this is how we do it. Mm. Um, I, I like the change. I'm a, I'm a big fan of change. You see, I've, I always try new things because I, I've always strived to get better. You know, even if you think you're the best at something, you're not. <laughs> there's always something. There's sure. always someone better, and there's always something better that you can do. And you know how it is. You get cocky on the cars, and then pretty soon the hand comes down and just slaps you. You know, yeah. you, know, you think this hood. is going to go well? Oh, no, not this time. <laughs> no, I, I mean, he, I haven't worked on cars in a long time mm -hmm. either. And, man, I, I literally was trying to help. I was following along one of the diagnostic procedures in, in a vehicle that was in the shop, and I'm like, wow, I <laughs> suck. I am not good anymore. I'd have to go back to school mm -hmm. and get caught up from all the stuff that's changed just in the last few years of me not touching mm -hmm. this stuff. It's it's weird. Yeah, people, I think, used to get into the business because they thought it was easy. It was a place to hide. Yeah. You know, if I do this, I can kind of be left alone. I think that was true of shop owners as well as technicians. Um, now I think people are getting into the business because it's hard. And people like a challenge. They yeah. want to. They want to be the person who problem solves. That has the ability to work on you know interesting technology. Yeah. Um, and that's that's just becoming the culture of the people that are involved. They want the challenge. They're rising to the challenge. You know they're they're um, ambitious. So yeah, I think that's sort of where we're we're turning. Mm -hmm. Yeah, mm -hmm. good. All right. Do we have any questions from the audience? You know, a couple of questions. Let's hear some. One uh, is on technology. What is the status of NFC, near field communication uh, technology today within cars, and what will it look like in the future? So I didn't catch that, did you? I heard NFC Champions, which is the <laughs> San Francisco 49ers. Very good. Um, nice. But, uh, has NFC uh, technology okay. that opens it up before you don't even have to put the key. Got it. Key Got mm -hmm. it. Um, yeah. What's your take on all that stuff? I got a couple of theories on that. I mean, it's great. I'm, I'm all for it. The best interface is no interface. So presumably, if you've got permission to open the car, the car should just open and you shouldn't have to deal with, you know, there was this whole joke about you could unlock the car with your phone. It's like, okay, the first step to unlocking the car with your phone is to unlock your phone. You know, it's just like, you're, you're, <laughs> this is the around the way way of just, just unlock the car, please. Um, so... Uh, yeah, more the merrier as far as I'm concerned. So we, uh, we've, we've worked on some Teslas and, you know, they have no key. You have to have the phone, right? So sometimes we'll get somebody that leaves a car here and we're like, I need your phone. Oh, I, I mean, they didn't think we, that they did they? Do? We can't, <laughs> we can't, we can't work on your car without your phone. So it's a weird, um, it's a weird thing, all the all the tech that's involved in that. It's kind of one of those things is like, at what point is it tech for tech's sake? Like, oh, we've gotten rid of the key, we've gotten rid of the door handle, we've gotten rid of this and that, there's no longer a radio knob. It's like, maybe I just need a radio knob. You know, maybe that's just the best way to do it. Uh, so maybe we've gone a little too far. Yeah. But this is a conversation we had last week with a, uh, a fellow car enthusiast, and I'm just, I just told him, I said, you know, we have to go out as service advisors, grab the mileage on a car, and some of these cars, you have to pull out the owner's manual to mm -hmm. figure out which menu mm -hmm. to navigate through mm -hmm. to get to the odometer. Mm -hmm. uh, it's like the point-of-sale systems, POSs. 
<laughs> you want, we want as shop owners, all these cool features. But what that does is it opens up the array of things you have to navigate through mm -hmm. to get it to operate. So it's, it's kind of like we are the victims of our own desires. Um, yeah, product design, you know, it, it evolves, right? It, typically, I mean, cars are hard because they come out, there's a seven year cycle to create a new car. And then once it exists, there's not much you can do to change it. Now, over the air updates and, you know, Tesla's able to, you know, change the skin of the screens and stuff like that, which is super cool. But, you know, ultimately the body and that stuff can't, can't yeah. change. So uh, the opportunity with, with software certainly is to, you know, try something. And if it doesn't work out, you can, you can improve it this way or that. There's a certain amount of penalty, which they call design debt or tech debt, which is you get yourself into a corner where you really, it's really hard to unwind, which is where a lot of the incumbent systems are which is to say that you look at, you know, Mitchell on demand and it's like, uh, or Mitchell manager, excuse me, and it's just like buttons everywhere, right? It's just a wall of buttons mm -hmm. and it's really hard to know how to navigate that. And it's really hard to unwind that because once you've learned that, you don't want that to go away. You don't want it to turn into a slick interface like shopware. Uh, certainly in our space, it's like, okay, how can we make this as intuitive as possible? For example, like your... Um, at this stage in the repair process, so you are likely to be looking for this information right now. Let's make that, you know, at yeah. at, at front as opposed to is. something else. And I think the car could probably do better at that too. So over time, maybe it's like, okay, I'm approaching the service facility, so maybe the odometer now is shown in the window as opposed to the radio. Uh, but we still got a long ways to go. Yeah, I mean, it, I can only imagine that. You know, it's like the BMW iDrive, right? Remember when that Hello, came out? Everyone's like, yeah. Right. Would you like me to not hit the wall? in front of you oh yes that would be great thank you um so you know the uh hello the, dave would you like me to oh shit oh well yeah, I dave, <laughs> you, you, you gotta get your phone son you know we can't drive without it uh, but the uh the interfacing of everything is is important because you know you're talking about your your point of sale stuff and you know we've all done demos because we've demoed several things because we're trying to find that right mm. efficient software that mm -hmm. makes our day-to-day, -day, because you've already explained what we do physically. That's nothing what we do uh, on the machines. Mm -hmm. So we've done demos and we've changed our software already and once before. Well, you're a Mitchell man. Yes. I was a Mitchell you man. You know all those buttons. Many, you knew, you could, you could make by, that button I just sing. Yes, yes. Play and, the orchestra and on And they seemed efficient at the time. They're, they're sure. the Chevy truck of POSs. <laughs> uh, and now we are... Are you, you a Chevy know, man? I'm a Chevy. I got it. So that, now we've stepped up into like the Maseratis, of, mm. you know, software type systems. But they do a demo and you're like, oh my gosh, this is fantastic. Mm -hmm. It can do that. It can do this. It can do that. Then you go live and you're like... <laughs> yeah i know it was a button on this screen somewhere yeah nope that's not it it's like you become mm -hmm. stupefied even yours yeah. i've demoed yours you gave us a uh, a sample thing mm -hmm. to use it's a blank right no mm -hmm. data in there so it's i've taken your demo seven times because i really like it but we've never used it in-house mm -hmm. and you set me up with a demo and a it's intuitive enough, but I'm like, wow, when they rip through this, this is so much easier to watch it. Um, so I've, I've gone in there, estimates, and I'm like, do you click on the quantity? No. You know, it's... Yeah, training. You need some training. It's, yeah. it's hard, too, because, like, you know, we want it to be like the Matrix, and you just plug in and sort of, you know, you learn how to fly the chopper without having to do any work. Yeah. And, Running a repair shop's a lot of work, and being able to learn that new system takes some time. Takes and, time. And um, and us being able to deliver it efficiently is also something that's a you know a, something that we take very seriously. Uh, but you know ultimately you, you do have to take some time to learn the new system, yep. and and that's a big commitment, especially for folks that are busy, right? So switching point of system point of sale systems is always um, something that folks you know, kind of want to avoid. Yeah. I have a joke with some of my friends. They see me coming. They're like, ah, yeah. it's like they're having a triggering yeah. response because they're like, I'm going to have to switch my shop management system. Um, but yeah, that's something we work through, right? And, yeah. Uh, it's kind so of your, uh, your typical rollout, what, uh, what is your typical client? If you have a typical, mm -hmm. when you, when they first sign on to mm -hmm. when they first go live? Mm -hmm. About 30 days. 
30 about 30 days, days. they're ready to roll. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and so we have a sequenced uh, curriculum for training during those uh, four weeks, and we do training with sort of the, you know, we train the trainer, if you will. Mm -hmm. So we have somebody who's the, the transitional lead mm -hmm. that's at the business. And then we spend some time, you know, answering specific questions. So we deliver training content and then follow back with what specifically do you have that you have open about your workflows and how you want to customize it. And then we do uh, data migration. So you can actually train on your data before you go live. And then we do a fresh data migration right before you go live so you don't lose any of your ROs. And uh, the data migration process itself is already, you know, a big big part of it because you're really attached to your old data and all your customer information and stuff. So mm -hmm. unlocking that and demystifying what the environment is going to be like day one, yeah. it's really, really important. And then, you know, we just, you know, work you through some drills so you feel comfortable with some really basic stuff. So you, you know, uh, create an estimate, write service, order parts, take payment. Those are the four things that everyone has to know how to do to be yep. able to stand it up at the counter day one. Yep. And we just really harp on that and everything else they'll figure out because it does yeah. seem very intuitive. When they've done the demos, it's simple, right? There's a lot of simplicity in it. It's those four key components that mm -hmm. you just described. Sometimes you get past all that, and then when you go live, you're like, holy shit, <laughs> somebody's in front of me, and I can't write it up. Yeah, you got to practice. Yeah, yeah. So, awesome. So, Carolyn, how do people, uh, how do people find out about Shopware, and how do they go about doing get a demo mm -hmm. or anything like that. Thank you, yeah. Uh, you can sign up online, so shopware.com, S-H-O-W, sorry, S-H-O-P dash W-A-R-E dot com, and sign up for a demo right there. It's whiskey. And uh, yeah, I don't I don't always drink bourbon, but when I do, it's in a tools garage mug. Um, and uh, so, uh, yeah, sign up for a demo, and one of our uh, product experts will follow up with you and set you up for the demo and answer all your questions, and excited to meet you, excited to help. Perfect. And one last thing, the digital inspection tool. Mm -hmm. So we've tried many of those mm -hmm. tools as well. Mm -hmm. Yours is built in. Mm -hmm. And what is it? Is it based off of something that the technicians have in their hand or is it just send pictures or is it integrated into the, to the yeah, so management? Yeah, so system? Shopware uses checklists as part of services, which mm -hmm. allows them to be infinitely granular that's kind of crazy seeming for folks that are used to standard dvis which is i just have kind of like a one size fits all or maybe i've got three or five or seven that i'm normally using um, so you can actually customize your inspections for whichever vehicle you're working on and it will just learn as you go so you'll have your hybrid inspections your truck inspections whatever um, you write it once and you never have to write it again and uh, you can also build you know, quality control and repair procedures and all that stuff into your checklist. So it's all built into the service. So the technician fills out the checklist on the web-based repair order. So they're actually inter interacting with the repair order online and they can use their phones, they can use a workstation, uh, whatever's the best for your workflow. And then when they're done filling that out and putting all their notes and their <coughs> findings, the photos, all that kind of stuff, then they can transfer it up to you at the front counter and you can dress it up and get in front of the customer. So very, cool. not unlike what you'd be used to with the traditional DVI. Cool. Well, the, a lot of these these things have the uh, databases, like if my technician's writing some notes in there and we as a, as a service advisor pop in there mm -hmm. and pop out, we might wipe out everything that they did. Yeah, that wouldn't be a problem. So yours is truly mm -hmm. web. Multiple people can be in there yep. doing the same thing. That's, that's a nice feature. That's <laughs> a nice feature. Wiped out many of my notes many times. Um, so what have you not mentioned about shopware that people should know? Um, let's see. Well, we've covered a lot. This has been awesome. Thank you for featuring You're us welcome. and all your, you no, know, your questions lot. and, um, maybe you can have us back after you go live and we can get your report on how it went and what you thought of it Sounds and how it's good. changed your business. See that hard pitch? Mm -hmm. Um, so, uh. Yeah, we're here for you. We'd love to meet you. You know how to reach us. Sign up for a demo. Um, 30 minutes can transform your shop. Nice. So shop-where.com. Carolyn. <laughs> she hates that, but I'm going to say it anyway. Dave the doctor tool. <laughs> right here for you live. So Carolyn, it's it's weird that it's taken us so long to I know. It's a pleasure. Thank you so much. A powerhouse in the industry like yourself. I should have reached out way, further, Ditto. way sooner. Um, but it's been a pleasure having you on my show. Thank you. For Thank coming. you for having me. Thanks for all you do. Shopwarefolks.com. Do the demo. You're going to love it. Carolyn out. I'm Dave, the car guy signing out.